in Let's Talk webinar series. Tonight's topic, Independent Living with Anita Inns. I'm Jane Dixon Weber, the Director of Education and Support Services at the Foundation. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, I have a couple of items. I'd like to thank you all for being members of the National Fragile X Foundation. Your support helps us do so much for families in the Fragile X community. As members of the, of the Foundation, your copy of Extra Special Anthology should be arriving in your house any day, so look for it and be sure to let us know if you don't receive it within the next week. We have a couple housekeeping items. We'll be taking pre um, questions at the end of the presentation and use the box at the right side for your questions. And, I'll and here we go. This is David in 2008. Um, this is the photo from graduation from the post-secondary residential school. He attended, it was called the VIP program, Vocational Independence Program, at the New York Institute of Technology in Central Islip, New York. And sleepaway camp, before this, a summer residential program at the same campus, and then a three-year residential program for the academic year, showed me that independent living with support is really possible. So some types of helpful preparation are just those that um, I mentioned. This is what lays the groundwork, in my view. So how did this all come about? Sure, he went to these schools, he did well. How did we form this group that would eventually form Point? As the kids were moving toward graduation in 2007, uh, parents started talking about what's the next step. And in fact, the school, VIP, did have a post-graduate program that was that Point is actually modeled on, but the New York Institute of Technology was actually going to stop supporting that program. And when all of the current students um, were, were done, they were closing the program. So we had to do something. And it was actually a great thing because that school is located in a suburban environment where you have to rely on driving or van service. And where we are now in White Plains, New York, is an urban environment and there's a lot of public transportation. So a group of families from the school, as well as families from summer camp and from high school programs and from other recreational programs started to meet. And we were 15 who started to meet and talk about um, the urban component. We were actually a larger group, probably about 30, but some people split off to form something in the suburbs, which is similar to Point, um, but it's actually more supported than Point. They have some people who, some support staff who actually live in the apartments near where the uh, young people live. That's not the case with Point. So, as you know, when people get together, passionate people like, like families of individuals with uh, disabilities, uh, great things can happen. And thankfully, that was the case. Um, we formed committees. As I said, we had the urban and suburban question. We had a, a group looking into what, uh, what government resources are um, available. We had a group studying what would the structure be? Would we form our own nonprofit corporation and, and run things ourselves? Or would we find existing social service agencies to run things for us? And we decided on the latter. So we ended up having, oh, I'm so sorry, that's my clock, eight chimes. Uh, it's, it's a little bit slow, as you can tell. Um, we ended up collaborating with two agencies, Westchester Jewish Community Services, and this is from their web, web page, and actually this is a photo of uh, three young people in point. It just so happened I was able to take a screenshot as the photos were scrolling through. And the second agency is Jewish Child Care Association of New York. Um, the program is non-sectarian. You certainly don't have have to be Jewish to be in the program. It just so happens that these are the two agencies we hooked up with. 
Um, and it has been very helpful, actually, that these two agencies are under the umbrella of a large uh, philanthropic, philanthropic organization called UJA, uh, which I think stands for United Jewish Appeal, and they have they have given us grants, so that's been very, very helpful. Okay, so I'd like to give you an overview of point, and, and then I'll go on and explain each, each, each of the components in more detail. It's kind of like, my, like our kids, to get the gestalt and then to look at the individual parts. So a key component is um, a weekly visit to the apartment by the program specialist. Um, this is a master's level, m most likely social worker. Um, who spends a half hour in the apartment making sure everything's okay physically and talking with the, um, uh, the participant and seeing how things are going. Uh, there is a monthly calendar of activities, which you'll see a sample of. There is a vocational program, 24-7 emergency, uh, which is key. There is a cell phone that is rotated among the key staff members and um, if an individual has to go to the emergency room or need some sort of um, emergency care, a staff member meets them and goes with them. So we, we value this tremendously. There are trips. Um, there are large trips twice a year. Um, they tend to alternate between cities and um, camp type settings. The next trips coming up are to, once again, to Frost Valley YMCA camp in Catskills, upper New York State, and then in the fall to Niagara Falls. So that's exciting. And my son signed up for those trips, which pleases me tremendously. Okay, so Point provides him with both alone time. He would love nothing better than to lie on that couch um, all day and watch TV. But thankfully, because of point, he doesn't. And he has plenty of social time and engaged time at work, et cetera, et cetera. So it is, it is very nice, though, that he does have the um, time that he can spend alone as he, as he pleases. So the participants, I'm not sure if I mentioned, there were 48 um, of them right now. We started at 15 in 2008. Um, they all have to make a commitment to be involved in a serious activity, either work, volunteering, attending school, or attending a day program. And my own son, David, who's turning 30 on March 8th, in fact, um, has three, three different part-time jobs. Um, the first one is his most serious job. He, he goes three days a week and he does cleaning at a center that provides occupational, physical, and speech therapy to young children. So clearly it's a perfect supportive environment for him. And he got started with this because he was actually seeing an OT there. And then they asked him if he wanted to volunteer, which he did, and then once the government benefit of supportive employment came through for him and he could get a job coach, they actually hired him. So it's, it's worked out beautifully. One day a week he participates in a point-sponsored internship where he does cleaning as well. And the fifth day he volunteers at a local synagogue working with the custodian and that also, he also actually got that through the agency because they, the uh, agency has a relationship with the synagogue. So living is, is in apartments, um, and families are actually responsible for finding the apartment, signing the lease, and paying the rent, etc. cetera. Um, we can, those who are eligible can get rent subsidies and subsidies for other housing costs from, from New York State, uh, as well as, of course, the federal SSI that they can get that can that can help pay the rent, and I'll be happy to answer these questions um, if there are still some left after after I'm done. But the agencies do not take on the responsibility of finding the apartment, so they're not certified housing; they're just simply apartments that 
that anybody would live in. The staffing. So there's a full-time director who has an MPH, oh, sorry, MPA. Um, there are three, three full-time program specialists who all happen to be social workers. There are four additional staff who, who do the things like the job support group, who go on trips um, for various activities. Um, they also are in charge of um, some of the activities such as uh, the yoga sessions, the tai chi, the mindfulness sessions. Uh, we have a photography group. We have a newspaper group. Etc. You'll 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 see the calendar further down. Then there are life skills trainers. We call them community habilitation workers, and these are either funded by um, government subsidy, as in our case, or they can be private pay. And the hours per week ranges depending on the participant needs from about three, I think, is the lowest per week, three hours, and the highest might be around 20 hours per week. David has eight hours a week of um, ComHab, and he now actually has two different individuals that provide those eight hours just because of scheduling. And there's also a dedicated Medicaid service coordinator who helps uh, the participants and the families with the, um, uh, the government funding that they can get. So here, here is an example of the schedule. Um, it's quite rich, and this has happened over the years. It did not start out this, this full. There are three internships that you can see. There's the Food Bank, the Grove, and the Greenberg Nature Center. These are the group internships where a staff member takes them in a van these, um, to the places to have the, um, uh, the participants work. And this is... Um, this is included in the point fee, which I'll get to later, but it, and it, it comes through a grant from UJA, actually, to the program. So as soon as a participant moves in, they can slide right into, into one of these group internships while they are working on their own um, and trying to find a job. Um, so this works out very, very nicely. There's something great called Theater for Action, which is um, it. They write a they write and produce a play, but it's also more of a group therapy kind of thing. So that's been very very popular. There's a, a job support every week that my son just loves going to. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why it's so special, but um, that's one of his favorite activities. Um, so I mentioned that there there are these group sponsored activity activities, um, cooking, um, public transportation training. There are the health sessions for yoga, etc. There are trips, um, things that are fun, but also are learning activities. And this is my son David in the purple shirt, and that's his. His, his roommate Max in the um, pinkish shirt, and this is actually a group session where they're um, learning how to cook a all-in-one dish, and I'm actually leading the uh, the group. Um, so it's this is his first um, apartment, which 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 was a rental actually, and here we are. Does not look scrumptious. Um, one of the staff members is very arty, and she she helped the group make this. It looks delicious. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it really is very very special. Um, this is not my skill set, so I totally uh, admire this. Um, I'd like to add that some people are skittish of photos, so I I try to be careful not to include too many photos of other people. The ones that I did include, I got off a public Facebook page, so um, I'm sure it's fine that I, I included them, but if you, if you wonder why, that's uh, the reason why. 
So a key component of the program is um, the vocational supports and included is a, voc a full vocational assessment when the participant joins. Um, and the, uh, the uh, development for an individual internship for that person, if that's appropriate, or just to stick with the group internship, if that's more appropriate. Um, there is on, on-site job coaching for the internship, um, uh, uh, transportation assistance if it's needed. For example, my son's internship through Point, um, he takes uh, the public bus to. So the staff member helped him, helped him learn the route. Um, there is this weekly job support group that I um, had, had mentioned. One of the participants calls it a, um, uh, he actually, I think he calls it an AA, an AA meeting because he feels like everybody comes and shares their problems. Um, it's not a derogatory, it's just um, that's how he, he, he refers to it. Um, and then they help with finding the government agency to provide job supports for paid jobs. In New York State, we call that Access VR. I'm sure that each state um, has their own name. And this is an internship award that I'm very, very proud of. Um, this is at the end of his first year, and what makes me most proud is the phrasing, the positive attitude you bring to your job and the members of the JCC. I mean, what more can a mom ask than an award like this? That's nice. It's very nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was very special. They had a whole ceremony and his grandma came. It was quite nice. That's wonderful. So um, we talked about these life skills trainers that we call ComHab. So again, um, ours is paid for by the government funding we have, but there are um, other members who either don't qualify for government funding or they're still on a waiting list, so they private pay for that service. And these um, life skills trainers work individually with um, participants by and large to teach, um, to hone in on their individual goals, shopping, cooking, cleaning, socializing, organizing their apartment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as, as I said, the hours vary depending on what the participant needs. And this is really key to independent living with support. Um, as you can imagine, there, ha there can be a lot of turnover. Um, ComHab workers fall in several categories, like the one that we have is, is an um, adult. She has her own family and she's a, she had been a support worker at an agency um, for the entire day, like eight to four, um, at what we call a, a day program. But then she ended that job and is actually doing more ComHab for four point. We also have students um, who are studying either special ed or social work who uh, like the experience and the extra money of this, of this work. So one of my bugaboos, as you know, I'm a nutritionist, is that they should spend time together cooking quantity foods and then storing them in portion sizes so that he can just heat them up. And I feel like I'm a broken record with this, always encouraging them, them to do this. But with this ComHab worker being there, this actually can and does happen. So here you go. You make a big pot of rice, and then you store it into individual portions. And then if you want to make a, a taco with your rotisserie chicken that you bought, you have the rice easily available. So learning how to use public transportation, that's uh, David again. And we have schedules um, in White Plains, they have schedules. And he's, this one is kind of complex. The others are, have fewer times, so it's not quite as dense. But he's actually learned how, learned how to use them. So if he needs to leave work early, he actually knows the time of the bus. And it's, it's, it's quite nice. 
So here's a weekend trip to a YMCA, YMCA camp, and can you see my cursor? Here's David, and this is his best friend that he's had since they've been three, and this is his apartment mate, Max. Nice. Okay, there are other activities aside from the ones that point sponsors or the ones that kids do on their own, like uh, the movies that are close by and uh, other things like that. More semi-structured activities, like there's special hockey, which David loves. I, I don't know if, um, if any of your young people have um, have discovered special hockey, but it's just it's just been fabulous. Uh, the ASHA American Special Hockey Association. I think there's actually more than one special hockey group. Uh, special Olympics, of course. There were two teams nearby. He had played, but he decided to stop playing. And then he joined the gym. We have Planet Fitness for $10 a month. It's, you know, fairly cost-effective, and um, he goes sometimes, so it's a good thing. Here he is in his first special hockey team, the Long Island Blues. This is while he, he was out at school at the uh, VIP program. He cuts an impressive image, doesn't he? I, I just think it's great. It's cool. Yeah. So, yeah. thank you. So, what are David's supports? So, I thought I should list them. And I didn't want to, but to be realistic, I had to put mom and dad on top because that is true. We are still his his main supports, but there's a whole list of others who are right there under, and as the years go on, in, in fact, we, we do provide less support and the others um, do more of, of the work and we're able to, in, for example, David will tell me, will you please R, RSVP for me for the um, Niagara Falls trip? I said no. They want you to call or email and RSVP yourself, and actually he did, so that's a great thing. All right, so his program specialist is Allison. She's she's um, she's a mom. She has high school age kids, so she you know totally gets it. Um, he has the two life skills trainers for eight eight hours a week. This past Sunday. Andrew is somebody new to him. He just he just started um, because he's available on Sunday. So his program specialist thought it'd be nice if, if he had somebody Sunday morning. So he needed jeans, so they went to Target and bought some jeans. So that was great. He has uh, his job coach for his um, eight-hour-a-week paid employment job. Uh, the superintendent and the handyman at his apartment building are very good supports, natural supports, in fact, but they are actually probably no more supportive than any other resident, but it's still very important to us. Um, he has wonderful doctors, primary care doctor and specialist um, that he calls and he goes to by himself by and large except those that he can't access through um, the public transportation and, and that's been a real gift that we found these very supportive doctors. Um, the staff at their offices are just, just fabulous people and the pharmacist at Target was just really, really very helpful and very, very respectful and very nice. Um, and I'm up there with him and we go out shopping or walking around. He'll be saying hello to any number of people, even when we ride the bus or something. He meets people he knows from the stores he shops in or the guy at Subway who makes a sandwich and um, I just think it's great. And then the, the participants in points are really support for each other. It's very, very powerful. Okay, so to summarize, the agencies are responsible for um, the staff, certainly, the 24-7, uh, um, etc. Oh, and, and a powerful thing is that they nurture the relationship between the participant and the program specialist. And they find that this is really key to success 
of the participant in, in the program, and, and I completely agree. And um, please don't think that they have this one program specialist that, that they have a relationship with, and then if the program specialist leaves, everything falls apart. That has not been the case. Um, there has been some turnover, not a lot, but some turnover, and they've adjusted really, really nicely to to the new program specialists. That's been quite nice. Um, so the families are responsible for housing, for the health care. Again, if there's an emergency, the staff member takes them to, um, to the hospital until um, the family member gets there or until somebody else can arrive, somebody who lives more locally, one of the families who live far away. <clears throat> so I guess I haven't said this yet, but there is an annual fee um, of approximately $10,000. Um, and at this point, this currently is all, all private pay, but we are working hard to try and get some components of, of that fee able to be paid for by Medicaid. We haven't been successful yet. Um, so all of the staff and the trips, um, the internships that I talked about all come from that fee. Um, and the families also have very strong input into um, um, the program matters. The steering committee meets with uh, program staff four times a year, every quarter. Um, and we also do fundraise to help with the um, uh, expenses. Um, so the government resources, of course, some of them will have a waiting list, but there's a federal SSI. Uh, New York State, the maximum, 733 plus 87 from the state. And as you know, any income the participant has, um, some of it gets subtracted from this maximum. Um, we have food stamps. David gets the maximum, which is 190 per month. And um, then there are also the subsidies from New York State, um, including a Medicaid waiver. As you know, that's half, half state money and half federal money. And in New York and certainly other states across the country, there is a push for a new way to do this funding. And the push comes from federal, from CMS, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Um, they are pushing each state to move toward what they call self-direction self so that um, it's person-centered, but also that uh, the money actually gets directed to the participant and the family rather than going through the agency. So that's really um, another topic for another talk. But the good part of that is that actually more aspects of their independent living can be covered through, through, this, um, through this system. Uh, some examples are rent, um, care of the home, which can include um, a cleaning person, um, the life skills trainers, uh, job coaching. They can also sign up for community classes. There are very strict rules. They have to be classes that are open to the public. They're very strong on inclusion, which has its downsides, as you can imagine. Um, they'll pay for uh, the uh, gym membership, personal trainer, etc. So this really has some good things for this model. So what am I relieved about? I am relieved that David can have this independent lifestyle, which really was our dream and um, seems to be working out very, very well. That he has a community of peers, but is also well integrated into the larger community. Uh, and that he has so many people now who are part of his, his circle of support. And very importantly, that our older son, who is 33, will not have sole responsibility for David. What do I worry about? Well, in addition to the regular things that everybody worries about, um, regardless of what kind of lifestyle um, the person has, I think these are the two things that crop up more because of this independent living lifestyle. Um, 
this is that David is, I would say, maybe more anxious than most. I've, I've heard that and I've seen that. And he can be very hyper aroused. Um, and I'm concerned that he'll get into trouble um, somewhere. There are all kinds of places that could happen. Um, and I'm also concerned that his, his needs will change, either his psychological needs or his health care needs, and that this lifestyle, that the supports won't be sufficient to, um, uh, to support it. <clears throat> so, um, if you'd like more information, um, you can contact POINT. Um, at their web, at their uh, email address. Um, here are the web pages of the two agencies. These are the point web pages. They're not very comprehensive, but there is some info there. Um, and you know, I have found that we can do this. That's that's David in the orange um, shirt right there. And we really, absolutely can can do this, thankfully. So, uh, your questions you can um, send to the, on the side, you can um, answer the question. I David does have a roommate, and so... Uh, does, um, he does have an apartment made. He lives in a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment. Um, and he's lived with this same guy since their senior year at the um, post-secondary school. And, and then, and I, how, so how often do you see him? Um, I don't think we see him more than a few times a month, maybe two or three times a month, but we talk to him many, many times a day. We've sort of gotten into a routine of his calling uh, when he's leaving for the bus for work, when he's on the bus, when he leaves work to take the bus home. It's just a routine we're, we're into. And, um, you know, it's fine. Uh, it seems a bit excessive, but um, it's not something that I'm willing to fight with him about, uh, to call me less often. Mm -hmm. does, he think, does he seem happy? Does he seem to like, you know, being independent like this? He really, really does. It, it um, absolutely seems, seems to suit him. Um, both the good and the bad of at least David, I think of of more kids who have fragile X is their they wear their their emotions on their sleeves. So he's very, very transparent. I can tell on the phone in about three seconds um, his his mood. I can tell if he's stressed, I can tell if he's happy. Um, he's just, you know, delighted. This this afternoon he, he calls me and he says Guess who just called me back? And he was delighted telling me that his doctor called him back because he had called his doctor to say that his side still hurts. So he was just peachy keen happy that this had worked out so well for him. So yes, I think he's happy. So do you guys have guardianship? We don't. David? We don't. We have um, a healthcare proxy. And um, whatever else the attorney had him sign, I can't remember what else besides health care proxy there is. But to be honest, um, I have never encountered a, um, a problem with having to, in, having to intervene or be the person um, to respond for him. If, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, we've never really felt like guardianship was, was the way to go for him. However, I, I have to add, he has really very little access to money. I mean, we, we control his money, so that's not, that's not a, a concern. Okay. Um, so you said that... So, so, who is it? Who's the person that comes by on weekly visits? Oh, that's the program specialist, Allison. She's a social worker, and she's and really my main contact. How long does she stay? How long are the the weekly visits? 
half hour. And what all do they do? Um, first of all, she looks around the apartment to make sure that things are copacetic, which in, in, in their case, both of these guys are very, very neat, so that's not a problem. In, in some of the other apartments, that's not the case. So the program specialist has to really monitor that things are um, <laughs> safe and sanitary, shall we say. But um, she does a, a, quick, a quick look around, and then she talks with him and sees how he's doing, if he has any questions. They'll go over the calendar and see if he's signed up for stuff, you know, make sure that he's going to things. Um, she'll help him sign up for things if, if he hasn't yet. Um, I asked her to work more with him on um, um, using the settings on, on his phone that can read the text and the emails to him, which he has so resistant to doing that, but I, she has never tried, so I thought maybe if she tries, that might work. Um, you know, so that? the part that I think that, um, you know, like if I was going to tell someone else about this, the part that I don't quite get is how you, how you actually went from, let's say, 15 families to, so, and, and before I say that, so are, do all the people live in the same apartment building? No, they live, I showed you two. Right. Um, there are about seven or eight. Okay. They're all within a mile of each other. So tell me again, I mean, if you can, so you had 15 families and then, and you had meetings and you had an idea of what you want and you decided on urban versus suburban, but right. then how did you actually like get the, the agencies, you know, like how did you take that next step? Okay, so we, we are all very active families and we all have various contacts. Um, I ran into somebody, totally coincidentally, I, 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 I ran into somebody who works for a social service agency and I told her my story and I said, who could I talk to at your agency who might be able to help us? And it turned out that she had a contact at, um, at uh, JCCA and they were very, very interested in this model because part, part of their work is, um, is transition, transitioning students who are graduating from school into um, post-school life. So, and then this agency is not, um, it's not signed up to work with um, New York State government funding, so they brought in a partner, WJCS, um, to work with them. And uh, WJCS especially has, has a lot of experience with um, individuals with disabilities. They have many, many group homes. And they're forward thinking and they know about all the person-centered planning and everything that was coming down and they were very interested in working this model out for us so that um, the young people could, could live there uh, with some staff support. So they were actually not ready, but we were ready. Our kids graduated in May and we said, I mean, this sounds very like, you know, like I'm, um, I'm saying how brave we were, but we actually kind of were. We said in August we are planning to have the kids start their leases and they are going to move in. When, when we were 15 that first summer, we did actually, they did actually all live in that first apartment house. So, um, we got lucky. There were a lot of empty apartments there and, and the landlord was very eager to rent them. So that worked out quite well for us. Yeah. Um, and they hired a part-time staff member for these 15 young people. Um, and they, we all lived pretty close by. I'm about an hour away. Um, but there were five or six or seven families who are much, much closer. So the parents were certainly around for stuff and they found things to do for the kids until this calendar got um, organized. And um, I think 
if you if you build it, they will come. We just had this vision because they had been at school together. Plus, we had seen the model that the school started. So we knew that this actually can work. OK. I just So I just realized I should just say this. I am not able to see the questions, but David is sending them to me, just so everyone who's on here um, can hear that. Um, David is sending me the questions. Um, I don't know why my chat box isn't working. So. Um, um, so I'm going to start through, Anita. So um, how did you find the families that were interested in doing this? Okay, so we were all, we were about eight families at this um, uh, um, post-secondary school. So we were eight right there. Then some of us had other family friends from sleepaway camps that the kids had gone to. Some people had friends from their high schools. So if there were eight, we each brought in a couple more. And that made 15. Then, and so how were these other 48 people added? OK, so then, um, I mean, they weren't added right away. It took, um, it took sort of a while. But we would go recruiting to the school. So the, um, the post-secondary school VIP, where, 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 um, where David went, we would go there. Um, they have an annual day of um, talking about the future. We would go there and talk about point. Um, people would go to their high schools and um, uh, speak about point. So we actively recruited, and um, the word of mouth actually worked. There were also some people who had been living in the um, Long Island um, uh, the graduate moving program that the school stopped supporting, some of those people moved into point. And now we have a much more um, uh, uh, sophisticated method where there's sort of a calendar of these events that happen um, and the, um, the, point, the point director goes to them at, um, <clears throat> there's a, a school on Cape Cod, Riverview, she goes there to present. There's a school in upstate New York, uh, Maple Brook. She goes there. Um, so there, there were places that send the most families, and we go every year. Sorry, I was going to sneeze, but I decided not to. Um, so tell me, so when you, so you find the apartment, so. Um, was David willing to go into the apartment? Did you have to transition him, or did he just so, move in? That's a very good question, um, and I have a story about that. Um, <clears throat> we went. We started the lease um, earlier than we were actually planning to have him move in. I'm not sure if it was two weeks or one week, but we spent. A, oh, and they also let us go up there because because it was empty. They let us go up there before we even uh, had um, had the move-in date. So we would go up there quite a bit. We would measure, we would talk about, you know, where the furniture would go. So we spent time in the apartment, absolutely. And also, um, there was one day where he was not that um, patient up upstairs with us while we're, you know, trying to figure out placement of the stuff in his bedroom. So he went downstairs to wait in the car. Okay, that was fine. Um, 15 minutes later, my cell phone rings, and it's somebody from the building management asking if it's my son outside in the car because somebody called the police. They thought he might be drunk. So he was um, hyper aroused, I would say, and he was turning on the car and maybe honking the horn and just opening and closing the door and somebody thought he was acting odd. So the police did come and um, luckily he had been trained. Um, my husband e explained to him, you know, Fragile X, it's a type of, oh no, he, it was actually the policeman. My husband explained some of the features of Fragile X and the policeman said, oh, is it like autism? We said, absolutely, just like autism. So thankfully, this cop had been trained. Um, so yes, there it was not always uh, sweetness and light. But um, when he moved in, 
Um, of course, that first night, I was like, oh my God, how, how will this ever happen? He was fine. We had spent time up there. He, of course, had lived with this roommate. He had several friends there also. So it took care of itself. That is really good. That's really good because transitions can be so hard. And hard for David still. But so we, we did the preparation. So when he come, how often does he come to your house now? Uh, he comes a lot less often even than we go up there. So I would say he comes maybe like for certain holidays. And the one, the one doctor he still has here is his, his dentist. So he sees her three times a year. Um, comes maybe every other month. So does he want to stay or is he willing to go back, excited yeah. to go back? Excited to go back, wanting to go back. He really, um, he likes his independence. He likes the fact that he can lie on the couch a lot more than when he's home. I mean, in reality, he's home so little that when he comes home, I don't complain about anything. But he knows that if he lived here, um, he would have to do a lot more than he does in his downtime up there. So going back is not a problem. He's, as you know, with our kids, they're in, into routine, and that's his, his routine now. That's where he lives, and he sees himself as an independent person. So he's about an hour from you now? Yeah, three quarters of an hour to an hour drive. Usually I take the train, so it's, it's longer, but that's my choice. And so there's seven or eight buildings all with kind of within a mile of each other yes. where the 48 kids live? Exactly. Um, is David able to tell you about staff and if they don't show up or if he oh, likes yes. them or if they're giving him choices, does he communicate that to you? Absolutely. Very, 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 very clearly. He doesn't always choose to, but he absolutely can. Um, uh, and it's, it's um, so these, these young people are pretty high functioning. I mean, it's not, when you say giving him choices, I mean, I'll, I'll ask him what he cooked or, or what he's planning to cook that day when he sees um, Winsome later. So he'll, he'll, he'll say to me, when, when she comes, when she comes, we'll decide. So, um, I think that means that they go through the recipes together and and choose what to cook. But I am not really worried about like um, you know, is is he being mistreated or is there abuse or anything like that? I, I think God forbid something like that happens, I would I would really know from so many other ways. Gotcha. Um so in your experience, what are the pros and cons of an integrated living situation versus a contained living situation where all the residents have special needs? That's a very, very good question. So the pros are that um, it's um, a very rich lifestyle. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for casual relationships that I know David values. When he sees a neighbor with a pizza box, they'll have a conversation about how they like that type of pizza. I don't think that type of conversation would happen with um, if he lived only with folks who have special needs. Um, he values his interactions in, in stores when he's the customer. Um, we go into the supermarket together. If I'm there sometimes, he goes up to the to the deli counter, and the guy says to him, "You want the usual?" And he says, "Yes, please." You know, which is like half a pound of, of Munster cheese or something. He wouldn't have that experience if he wouldn't in this uh, independent lifestyle. Gotcha. So that's those are the pros. The cons, I think, it's probably more stressful for him. Um, as I mentioned, he's pretty anxious and he does get hyper aroused by things like 
if there's a neighbor that he thinks doesn't like him, whether or not that's accurate, he, he has had stress from that. Um, and that can lead to hyper arousal uh, outbursts, so to speak. So that, that is definitely a con and that, and that it is a problem. Um, the guy at the front desk, the concierge, has called, um, has called the apartment sometimes to tell them that the neighbor is complaining about noise. And when the um, life skills trainer and the program specialist come, they do check in with him to see if there are any issues going on. So um, I do think that there is more stress for him in this um, environment. That's a downside. Yeah, I could see that. I, could, I mean, I guess, you know, I think that, you know, when I just think every family needs to look at their child and there and you know that where they live and their environment to see what's really best for their for, uh, for their child. This sounds perfect for David. Um, someone asked you if you could put up the screen on the uh, Point website so they could write down the websites. Oh sure. Go back to that screen. I can uh, do that. Let me see. There is a question regarding guardianship and living. Also, if you if you Google. Um, if you Google WJCS point program, I believe you'll get to it. So someone has a question with regards to guardianship and living on their own. It says, I was told it was essential to have guardianship if they weren't able to communicate clearly their needs on their own, that it was important to have this. Do you think it's not, so I mean, we, we talked briefly about guardianship. But what, do you have any pros and cons of guardianship and living on uh, your own? Um, I I can't really answer that question because I do think that he can um, he can communicate his needs clearly, and people know to contact me if there is a question about something. So I really can't answer that question. I do think that there are some of those 48 where the parents are the guardians. I don't know how many. But I'm sure that there are um, several, if not, if not, you know, more than several. So even though you don't have guardianship, do you have permission with uh, his doctors for them to contact you? Because you, you don't have to have guardianship if you have written permission for them exactly. to contact you. Exactly. That's, that's exactly right. And thank you for raising that. That's a good point. Um, yes, so we asked the program to set up a sheet for um, the participant to sign that the staff can contact us so that they do. Um, with, with his doctor, I'm not sure if there was an official document or not, but he certainly contacts me. Um, uh, but the one thing that has helped tremendously was um, with some of the agencies that provide support, like the job coaching, um, we had heard stories about um, some of the job coaching agencies. So these are not the ones we work with. These are other agencies that provide the job coaching. Um, we had heard stories from other families in other places where the job coach wouldn't talk to, to the mom or the dad because they said, well, you know, there's my client, HIPAA, blah, blah, blah. So when, when we started with these agencies, we made sure to put into to play that our child would sign a form allowing them to talk to us. And that was really key for them to get um, a better service. So is there a high rate of staff turnover? I've heard it can be as high as 30% turnover per month. So now remember this is, that not, high? this is not a typical program um, and it's not the typical kind of relationship that staff has with um, the participants. So um, the program specialists have had very little turnover. Um, the ComHab workers, there is more turnover, but it's nowhere near that high. Um, they tend, like if they're students, they'll stay for a year or two because then, then they graduate and move on. Um, there have been there have been a few. I, I think I think the program has a lot of these comhab workers, like like fifteen or twenty, because they're all part time jobs. 
So there have been one or two that um, there have been some issues with. In fact, there was one who was actually caught stealing from the participant. That was not pretty, but they, they found him. Um, they set up a camera, actually, and, and found him. Um, so our, our turnover is really not that high. And, and the, um, our director is very, very good, and she has honed her interviewing skills and her um, job advertising skills. So she really gets, gets good people. Um, we're approaching the, or we're at the top of the hour, and we'll, but we have one more question. Um, does he go out independently when there isn't a scheduled activity? Absolutely. He goes to the supermarket by himself. He goes um, to exchange his canister for his seltzer maker by himself. Um, probably doesn't go to the gym by himself. He goes with a friend just because he enjoys it better, but he absolutely walks around White Plains. He comes to the city by himself. He comes to our house by himself. He takes the train. Um, so yes, he's very uh, man about town, and I think that's one of the pros of this lifestyle. Okay, wait just a second. I have one, we have one final question coming. Has it, I, I still can't see it, David. Do you have the question? Oh, he's, David's typing it. Um, can Svetlana, I've uh, I've uh, unmuted you. If you'd like to ask your question. Oh, there you go. We have a we're gonna have a live question, Anita. And this will be our last one. And then uh, I want people to know that if they have further questions, um, Anita, if you want, you can put your email back up for others to see. But so you know, after Svetlana answers her question, we'll, um, this will be the last one. But I, feel free to Anita, uh, email Anita with any additional questions. Yes, Svetlana, what's your question? Hi, Anita. Um, I live in Seattle. Are you aware of any models similar to this in Washington State? Yeah, so I think we've met at, at a conference, yes. right? Yes, we did. My son is 26 right now. He's 26 years yeah. old. And I am going today to the meeting for independent living. But we right. don't have any model like this. He has Section 8 and we have adult family home. Oh, that's great. Um, I don't know about any models in Washington. I believe there is one in California that seems similar. Um, so I am sorry, but I, I don't. Okay. But good for you. Keep keep it up. I'm I'm sure you'll get there. Thank section, you. Section eight is great, so that's that's a good start. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very helpful and interesting. It's a great model you guys have. Great. Thank you. I, I would be happy to answer questions, and I hope to see you in July at the conference. Coming. Yes, I, I will see you too, and Jane too. Good, good. I look forward to it. Okay, Anita, I think we should close down for the night. Uh, you guys have Anita's email address if you have questions, or you can ask me questions, and I can um, you know, f f pass them on to Anita too. Um, so thank you, Anita. Thank you My for pleasure. sharing your expertise with us. Um, just so everyone knows, we have several webinars coming up this year. The next one will be on March 24th, and it will be with Mouse and Tracy. And they'll be talking about Fragile X Syndrome, Autism, and Behavior. It will, it will be an entire question and answer session. They will not be doing a presentation. They're going to start with questions right away. And I'll make sure I get my questions, uh, my question bar working so David doesn't have to send me questions. Um, so thank you all. It will be at the same time on March 24th, but watch for email announcements coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, Anita, thank you. Do you have any final closing comments you'd like to make? Uh, thank you for you spending, spending this time with me, and um, I'd be happy to speak to you, email you, and, uh, share, and share, share what we have so loved experiencing with POINT. So Anita will be at the conference this summer. So yeah, come pick her brain at the conference. And, um, and maybe uh, I'll be chosen to do a presentation. That would be awesome. There you go. There you <laughs> go. 
All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We do appreciate your time, and um, we're always here if you need us. So don't ever hesitate to to send me an email or call me. Thank you, and take care. Thank you. Good night.